Uh, this speaker today is going, it is Adriana Arcia. She's a professor at the House School of Nursing and Health Sciences at the University of San Diego. Dr. Arcia, it is a nurse scientist and is well known researcher for developing tailored health infographics using participatory design methods. A main focus of her work has been using information visualizations to assist individuals to understand their personal health information, especially those with low health literacy and or limited English proficiency. Health information needs are addressed in a way that is culturally congruent and also health literate. She has an impressive list of publication and projects funded by numerous organization funding agencies, such as the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the National Institute of Nursing Research, the National Institute of Aging, the Alzheimer's Association, just to mention a few. I want to mention that in 1922, Dr. Arcia was induced in the American Academy of Nursing. The title of her presentation today is Participatory Design of Health Infographics for patients, health participants, caregivers, and the community. I would like to welcome Dr. Arcia to what well, we should say the podium, the virtual podium at this time. But also I want to welcome her in Spanish. Bienvenida, Dr. Arcia. Es con un gran honor y gusto que tengo la oportunidad de presentarla. Y estamos con mucha ansiedad con mucho gusto de oírle su presentación. Welcome. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be with all of you today. I am going, as um, Dr. Cleveland mentioned, I'm going to be talking, about, uh, let's see, can you all see my slides? Yes, okay, excellent. So I'm going to be talking today, as, as you mentioned, about participatory design of health infographics. Um, I will be showing you a lot of images in English, but everything you see also has a Spanish version, and some of the more recent infographics also have versions in Chinese and Bangla. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this work was carried out with a number of different collaborators. Chief among them is my mentor, Dr. Suzanne Bakken, who is a professor at Columbia and the editor-in-chief of the Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association. So I'm going to show you two slides in short succession, and you won't have time to take them in and really read them. I'm just going to show them briefly, and I'm going to ask you to think about which you prefer and why. And when we do this in person, you know, I did have people do a show of hands, uh, but just, you know, think to yourself which one you prefer. So here's the first one. And here's the second one. Now, having shown these slides many, many times, I can tell you that I think only maybe one or two people have ever told me that they prefer the text slide. And that's because visualizations, images, they're more engaging. We're using color, symbols, um, visual analogies, that they're helping us to communicate. And so that is the really the rationale for using images um, as, we, as we move forward. So. Here's our agenda for today. I'm gonna to just distinguish between a few different types of visualizations. We're gonna talk about uh, very briefly the visualization development process and how we use participatory design. I'm gonna show you a few examples of some of the health infographics we've developed over the years and just kind of go over some of the key learnings so far. So key learnings is gonna be about half and then the, the last half uh, will be talking about the Taylor Viz Toolbox, which is our most recent project. So. Imaging, what is imaging? What is data visualization? What is information visualization? Imaging refers to things like CT scans, MRIs, X-rays, that kind of thing. We're not talking about that today. So then oft oftentimes people use these terms data and information visualization kind of uh, interchangeably, but there is a difference. If we, it's helpful to think about this along the explore, explain continuum. So data visualization is on the explore side. When may, maybe we have big data, we don't know what it is that we are have, we're trying to discover something, we're trying to learn. And so the those types of visualization tools are meant to help us with that. But if we're going up the DIKW pyramid, if we're taking the raw data and we're processing it into information, 
and maybe we have communicative intent, we have a particular message, that's going to give us the explain side of the continuum, and that's information visualization. That's what we're talking about today. So healthcare has a very, very long history of using visual aids for clinical care. So we've all seen anatomical posters, food pyramid recommendations, instructions for how to do physical therapy exercises, et cetera. However, the vast majority of those visualizations I would classify as generic, which is to say that they're the same for every viewer. Everybody sees the same poster, right? So when we tailor a visualization, we'll actually modify the image in some way. Usually it's based on data we have on the viewer. So in the case of the example at right, we have tailored this infographic with the prolonged stress score of the viewer, and we're comparing it to others in their cohort, in this case, a research cohort. Of course, we don't have artists stationed in every medical exam room. Maybe it would be cool if we did, but we didn't. So tailoring is made possible at scale because of technological tools that can automate the tailoring for us. That's where the informatics comes in. So some of the work I do is uh, with work with programmers to create bespoke software that tailors the visualizations that we have designed. Before we get into talking about that though, I wanna take a quick look at the process for creating visualizations. So, oh, come on, there we go. All right, so here you're seeing a brief overview of the process. We start by whatever visualization we want to create or whatever, information we want to convey, we try to come up with as many different prototype visualizations as we can to convey that idea. And then we start our participatory design process. We bring together members of the target audience and we say, okay, here's two things, you know, two ways of showing the same information, which do you prefer, why, we, you know, hand vote, that kind of thing. We get feedback for how to improve it. And then between design sessions, we make changes. We continue to iterate until we reach the point of design saturation, which is the point at which people are, our participants telling us they're satisfied with the images that we're showing them. And we're not getting really any substantive feedback, um, any big changes to, for feedback, at which point we're ready to automate the infographics. And then we're ready for outcomes testing, which usually I'm interested in things like comprehension, but it could be any number of um, different things like motivation or behavior change, for instance. So here's an example of a, a returning research data to participants and uh, an infographic designed to do that. So here, this is a visualization of the Kessler psychological distress score, which was collected for a research project. And if I just say to you, you have an 18 on the Kessler, that's not going to mean very much to you. So here, what we're trying to do is help the viewer interpret what does an 18 mean. In this case, we're taking multiple variables, uh, physical activity, overall health, mental health, and fruit and vegetable consumption, and combining them into one graphic so that the viewer can compare themselves to the ideal. We've also uh, done a study to return research data to participants. In this case, this is for the Zeret Caregiving Burden interview. Uh, and this is this particular project for, was for Hispanic family caregivers of, of persons with dementia. So, if I say to you, you have a score of 42, maybe not that helpful, but if you see it like this, then you can help to interpret what that means. As part of that project, we also created this uh, stages of dementia roadmap uh, to help the caregivers understand their loved one's functional stages of dementia. So that's the Alzheimer's Association funded project that I've been working on. We've been creating an app for that. And then, of course, we can return clinical data to patients. Here's an example showing someone their level of asthma control. I'm going to come back to this one in a few minutes. So what have we learned so far? I want to recap some of the key findings from the research. For our very first research project, our biggest task was figuring out what kinds of graphical formats were most appropriate depending upon the type of data that we had. So at the time, we couldn't find any guidance in the literature at all on how to visualize blood pressure, for example, and that was an important variable in that study. So I'm gonna show you some of the prototypes that we showed people. They all have the same blood pressure values, they're just shown in different ways. Now, conventional wisdom says less is more. So by that logic, we would choose image A uh, with the stoplights. Um, and although we did have some participants who preferred A, the very large majority preferred D because it was the most informative. So let's take a closer look at the final product. Uh, this was you know, to show you after the designer cleaned it up. 
So here's, uh, here's that image, and I'm gonna walk you through what makes this image successful. One, it's information rich. So just because people might have lower literacy, that does not diminish their desire for information, right? It just has to be presented in an accessible way. Two, it uses a familiar color analogy. So stoplight colors are very, very powerful in their ability to communicate. We do, however, need to be thoughtful about our labeling and the specific shades of red and green that we use so that we don't disadvantage viewers with color blindness. But it's just so, this palette is so powerful that we couldn't walk away from it. Three, the number lines support comparison. So we can easily compare this patient's blood pressure numbers to the reference ranges to make sense of them. And four, we're providing context. The image on the upper left reminds the viewer how we arrived at the blood pressure value, and the figure on the right tells us why we should care. So another format that worked well was the visual analogy. Anyone who has ever owned a cell phone understands the consequences of getting into the red like this icon on the right, but it's almost more instructive to look at what we tried and didn't work. So the next set of slides are things that we do not recommend. They're things that did not work. So one of the things we discovered is that people are very, very literal, like super literal. If you don't read Spanish, the title says fruit servings per week. And here we're comparing how many vic servings Victor ate to what was reported by other men his age to the dietary recommendation. And when I showed this to my participants, they only talked about apples. Wow, Victor really likes apples. So many apples. Victor eats apples every day. They didn't generalize to other fruits. Now, occasionally someone would do the mental math and point out that, uh, you know, that only works out to two servings per day, but most people didn't do that. I had been avoiding showing servings per day because I wanted to use only whole numbers instead of decimals, because decimals can be a problem sometimes. But it seemed that avoiding mental math is more important. And more important than that, I wanted people to understand that we meant fruit generally, not just apples. So the participants told me that to accomplish that, I had to show a variety of fruits. You can't just show apples. Okay, so I dutifully created these icons combining a variety of fruits. The people who saw the apples and then saw this said, ah, this is much better because you can see there's a variety of fruits. But I tested again, and it's always important to test more than once. And I only showed this without showing the apples. You know what they said? Victor eats the same fruits every day. I had my sweet little ladies carefully studying the paper, looking at it and saying, banana, apple, grape, a whole pineapple, right? Very, very literal. Here are a couple more examples of literal interpretation. We had participants tell us that Victor has four pairs of shoes, whereas the other men have three. They told us that these are the kinds of shoes you should wear to exercise. They told us that Maria was active, that she was fast. They even told me that she was an educator and did good things for her community, but many, many participants could not tell me how many days per week Maria exercised. Furthermore, the conversation was about walking, running, jogging, but participants never talked about other forms of exercise like swimming or soccer. And they couldn't give me any suggestions for what image would convey exercise more generally better than the jogger. So what we figured out was that in the presence of this propensity for literal interpretation, it's very difficult to represent concepts at a low level abstraction, like fruit or exercise. These are low level abstractions. Furthermore, the graphical format, uh, which you might know as an isotype format, uh, it was simply not familiar to our participants, which is really curious, right? Because the stars, those were a big hit and worked really well. So why did the joggers fail? They're fundamentally the same format, right? Well, no, two reasons. One, our culture has trained us to use the stars. Specifically, uh, they've we've been trained with online shopping, movie ratings. They are a familiar convention. Uh, if you've ever heard of, of Edward Tufte, he's a visualization expert who's written a number of books. And I took his one day workshop back in 2013 or so, and I asked for his advice about communicating effectively with my audience. And he said that I should pay attention to what works in the wild. Uh, he gave the example of supermarket circulars and Google Maps. And the effectiveness of the stars is the kind of thing that he meant. This is what works in the wild. Uh, the reason number two is that the image on the left is clearly metaphorical and it re represents degrees of something. People don't think that we're telling them that they have four actual stars. With the image on the right, 
we're using repeated icons to represent repeated instances of some more general class of things. And that, that's what was in an unfamiliar graphical convention for our participants. So although these look as though they are in the same format, there are fundamental differences between them that affect comprehension. An issue that I think contributed to the problems we saw with literal interpretation is that many participants seem to ignore the titles of the slides, of the images. So there might be that one person in the group who had a college education and they pointed out the title to the others and that the recommendation really worked out to only two servings per day. And then other folks would say, oh, I, I didn't see that. By watching people look at the infographics and following their gaze, the pattern that I observed was that they would look at the image first and then maybe, maybe consult the title if they were felt unsure about what they were looking at. So this happened often enough that I started calling it title neglect, kind of like denominator neglect can prevent people from accurately interpreting fractions. So I got a really vivid illustration of this phenomenon when I was doing a study comparing infographics to a text only condition. So on the left is the information provided to the participant. This is what she was looking at. And we had a whole conversation about how she couldn't figure out what her BMI was. It's right at the top. But she, she said she knew she wasn't overweight, so she guessed that her BMI was in the normal range, but she couldn't actually find her BMI value. I said, so what does it say at the very top of the page? And she read to me the second line. She'd been systematically skipping the first line, even though the font was the same size as the rest of the text, presumably because she assumed that it was a title and therefore not important. So this was a really vivid illustration of title neglect. What's curious about this phenomenon of title neglect that I observed is directly contradictory to experimental work, showing that titles may be what people remember the most about a visualization. But I think we can agree that the kinds of visualizations that we're showing in my studies are pretty different from what they are showing in these experimental studies. The ones on the left cannot be interpreted without reading some text. You have to know something, right? Whereas mine, they seem like maybe they could be self-explanatory. So that's a, that's a big difference. And the research participant populations are pretty different as well. So this is a topic that I haven't had a, a chance to test out in a systematic way. It would require an eye tracking study, I think. So unfortunately, I don't have a lot of answers yet to questions like how prevalent is title neglect? Who does it? Why? Under what conditions? Those are open questions for me. What I had determined at this point in my research is that when they were inclined to do so, my participants could read accessible text pretty okay. They weren't struggling with the words so much as they were struggling with interpretation, with understanding the implications of what they had read. But given that simple text was okay, was fine, and I had already settled on number lines as being the best format for a lot of the data types that we wanted to convey, I started putting words back into my infographics. Here's the front cover of a pamphlet on the left and the inside spread on the right uh, of a pamphlet designed to show patients their level of asthma control. Now, my designer, Nicole, and I have done a couple of things here. First, we've essentially put the title on the cover to force people to read it. Uh, that's kind of our workaround there. And we've put a small redundant title here at the top of the inside spread specifically so that people can skip it without missing anything important. Then we've just given people the punchline, your asthma is not in control, your score is 2.5. When I watch people as they read this, I see them start gently nodding their heads because all of the cues are pointing to the same conclusion and they have greater confidence that they've arrived at the correct interpretation of what they're looking at. Another innovation that came with this project was successfully and comprehensively putting two data points on the same number line. So we were able to demonstrate that that worked. What participants told me next though, turned out to be very important. They said, it's all very well and good to know that my asthma is not in control, but what should I do about it? So on the back of the pamphlet, we left space for the patient or the clinician to handwrite in highlights of the care plan. We were discussing with them how the section should be labeled. We thought your healthcare provider's recommendation. And they're like, no, plan for you. That's it, simple. Patients want the bottom line. There have been times when I've asked participants what they want to know about a given health topic, and occasionally they'll say everything. I want to know everything. I'm here to tell you they do not mean it. What they mean is I want to know everything that is relevant to me and actionable and no more than that. So here's another example from the asthma project. This is a sample output from a spirometer. It's what's used to test lung function. And as you can see, there's a lot happening here. 
Clinicians require extra training to interpret it because of its complexity. In particular, this chart on the lower left, it's called a flow volume loop, takes time to really understand because it's got liters on the x-axis and liters per second on the y-axis, which is not at all intuitive. When I was, I was like, I think I understand it. Nope, no, no, I don't, I don't. So despite all this complexity, my co-investigator, Maureen George, wanted to see if we could extract something useful from here to share with patients. So to make this work, we'd have to introduce a little terminology, we'd have to provide numerical results and visualize anything that might be hard to understand in order to help people interpret these metrics. So it was a tall order. It wasn't at all guaranteed that we would, un oh, I'm just realizing there's arrows all over my screen, uh, that it would work out. So let me see, how do I... Uh... I don't know if, how to clear those. Well, hopefully they won't be too distracting. Um, we'll keep going. So I decided to give it a shot anyway. This is my very first sketch for this design. And here we're introducing the terminology for two metrics. FEV1 is how much air you blew out in one second. And FEV1 predicted is how much people like you were expected to blow out. We give the numerical results for those metrics, and we use an icon array to show what the ratio of 71% unobstructed lung volume looks like. On the bottom right, we define the levels of obstruction. So um, my rationale for using an icon array was that I knew that visualization should be used to ease the most effortful parts of sense making. In this case, I identified the part to whole relationship as the part that I thought that could use the most support. Spoiler, I was wrong about that. Um, but I didn't have the terminology for it at the time, but I was applying the conceptual metaphor that lungs are a container. The logical consequence of that is that they can be filled, but in this case, not all the way. So we showed this to some focus groups and our participants did not like it. They weren't fans of really anything about this sketch, but especially the icon array, because to them, the dark blocks signified obstruction. Whereas I was trying out the lungs are a container metaphor, they were seeing good is light and bad is dark. We were speaking different languages entirely. They wanted me to reverse the colors like this. It still wasn't a winner though. Um, far from it. I was able to get my graphic designer on board and together we took a different approach. Here, our visual focus is on illustrating the three categories to make those easier to understand. But this was still a big womp womp. Like participants were overwhelmed by all the terms and the numbers, they really didn't like it. So then I thought, what if I present the information in the same way that I would if I were just having a conversation with someone, like talking them through, explaining the ideas and scaffolding the information. So here's an early draft of what we would call a visual explanation. And uh, this is my draft, so not that great, but after my graphic designer got through with it, it was much better and it looked like this. So now we're cooking with gas. It has nearly all of the same information as before, but through layout, size, and color, we've created an information hierarchy. We're still introducing the technical terminology, but it's de-emphasized because it's not the main point. So these, uh, these things here. Um, and then if you only read the, the large text, you'll still get the most important message. And people felt that the belted lungs really reflected their subjective experience of asthma, which was way more meaningful to them than some dumb balloons. So, it turns out that the most effortful part of sense making was not the 72% part to whole relationship. People actually feel pretty comfortable with percentages. Rather, the hard part was the concept of liters of air. Most of us don't spend time thinking about volume of air, uh, so that's confusing to begin with. But on top of that, Americans don't use liters, except two liter bottles of soda. That is the only cultural referent I could think of. So this works because we've converted an unfamiliar metric into familiar terms by leveraging an existing competency. That is the competency of how big a two liter bottle of soda is and what it feels like. We all have that sense memory. What's funny is that I had tried out the conceptual metaphor of lungs as a container. I'd abandoned it and then come right back around to it just in a different way. But it's not the only conceptual metaphor at play here. See, I was initially reluctant to use the bottle approach because what we're showing is actually inaccurate. Gas expands to fill whatever container you put it in. But I've shown this to hundreds and hundreds of people. And the very first person to complain was actually fairly recently, uh, an old friend who's a physics professor. And she had major issues with this image. She was just spluttering, but, but, but. And I said, I know, I know, I know. But nobody else ever complains because the depiction is useful. 
it helps us, we're willing to apply the conceptual metaphor that air is a liquid because it helps us to understand liters of air. I had a participant who had not completed high school tell me that anyone could understand this. And that was incredibly rewarding because as you can see, getting to this point was not easy. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift gears here. All of the infographic examples I've shown you so far are tailored to an individual. What's your blood pressure or asthma control score or your caregiving burden score? In our most recent project though, we shifted gears uh, to tailoring for communities. Community-based organizations are a really important source of health information because of the trust that they've established with the clients they serve. And as we know, infographics are an engaging and useful way to convey health information, but they should be tailored to the target audience in terms of language and culture. For tailoring to be feasible at scale, it has to be automated, which means that the CBOs, they need digital tools to make changes to content and to add their organization's branding, for instance, their logo. So I'm gonna talk about the ongoing development of TaylorViz Toolbox to meet those needs. Our starting use case was infographics about COVID-19 testing and vaccination, but this is just a starting point. TaylorViz Toolbox will be extensible to infographics about any topic. So here are our aims. I'm gonna go through each of them in turn. For aim one, we wanted to identify the priority information needs of our predominantly Hispanic and black community members in lower Manhattan. So although we later expanded our study to additional Chinese and Bangla speaking communities in New York City, here I'm reporting only on the results of our work in English and Spanish. The QR code will take you to our OSF repository. It contains all of our data collection tools and forms. And you can see the finished infographics there as well. And I'll, I'll, keep sh I'll show it again. Uh, with the help of our CBO partners, we recruited adult participants to complete a quantitative survey and qualitative interviews. Here you can see some characteristics of our community survey sample. At the time of their initial participation, nearly two thirds had tested positive for COVID at some point, and over 60% had experienced job loss in their household because of COVID. So to give you an idea of uh, a lot of these people were essential workers, for instance. And over a third of our respondents answered this numeracy question about disease risk incorrectly. Respondents' top reasons for getting the vaccine were to keep family, self, and community safe, but top reasons driving hesitancy were concerns about side effects and safety and a lack of understanding of how the vaccine works. So here's what we learned from those surveys and interviews. We found that our participants felt comfortable interpreting positive and negative test results, but they were not always clear on the differences between the tests. In particular, they tended to conflate the sample collection method with the test itself, so leading to confusion if the sample collection method changed. For instance, initially PCRs were only a deep nasal swab, but eventually they started to do shallow nasal swabs as well. Is it the same thing? People got confused. Many of our participants preferred antibody tests because they believed that a blood test would be the most reliable. This is important because antibody tests are not diagnostic, right? And therefore they're not useful for preventing the spread of the disease. With respect to vaccination, participants held a wide variety of positive and negative beliefs and their information needs varied by personal circumstances and stage in life. Many were concerned about the speed with which vaccines were developed, whereas others worried about the impact on future fertility, childbearing and lactation. So nearly all participants were unaware of how the new mRNA vaccines work, which meant that they erroneously believed that the vaccines contain the virus, which they don't. So learning that there is no virus in mRNA vaccines was a real game changer for many people, leading to more favorable attitudes about vaccination. So based on our AIM-1 findings, we determined that one, our toolbox should facilitate two levels of tailoring. At the organizational level, CBOs should be able to brand the info infographics and make edits to the content, then additional tailoring could be done for specific clients. Two, the testing infographics should facilitate a side-by-side -side comparison of the various tests and permit CBO level tailoring of features such as screenshots of positive and negative test results. We'll see that in a minute. Three, the vaccination infographic would have two parts, core content about the virus and the vaccine, and then additional optional modules addressing frequently asked questions. Four, our text would use numbers sparingly, be concise, and use accessible language without sacrificing accuracy. 
So in AIM 2, we moved on to the infographic development, starting with detailing our use cases and visual learning objectives with a design brief for an, each infographic. And drawing from our original pool of survey respondents, we invited community members to complete a design survey. We did that to help us narrow down the graphical style of some of our graphical elements. I then worked closely with our professional graphic designer and illustrator, Alexa, to create prototype infographics that we refined over a series of 15 participatory design sessions with a total of 27 of our community members. Lastly, we conducted an online survey to give us just a preliminary evaluation of the infographics that came out of that participatory design process. Here's an example item from the design survey. Respondents were about evenly split between the styles A and B, so we moved forward with a hybrid of these. We kind of mushed them together. As we worked on prototypes, we found that it was much easier to tell the story of how vaccines work by personifying the virus and the body's immune cells with these little guys here. I think they're so cute. However, we were concerned that participants would find this approach childish or insufficiently authoritative. However, compared to our more traditional textbook style of illustration, I'm here to tell you the personified approach was universally preferred. Given that a key information need was distinguishing between the different kinds of COVID tests, it was important to us that participants pay attention to the top part of this page. Here we're seeing diagnostic versus antibody. However, it just could not compete with the eye-catching illustrations in the center of the page. So we tried highlighting, we tried underlining without any luck, uh, but I worked off the premise that there's nothing that people like looking at more than other people, except for maybe cats. And so we added a person to the top of the page and you know what, even some red text for good measure. So here you can see the final four page testing information infographic. If you go to our repository, uh, you can see the, the full PDFs. So. For our vaccine infographic in the personified style, it's what we moved forward with, the core content was information about how the virus makes you sick, that's this section here, and how the vaccine works, that's the rest of the pamphlet. And then to address the other varied questions that our community members had, we created these optional modules that can be appended to the end of the vaccine PDF. They can just get stacked on to the end. So in this way, the infographics can be tailored to the individual information needs of the viewer. To round out our infographic development aim, we conducted an online evaluation survey and respondents rated both infographics highly on ease of understanding, attractiveness and trustworthiness. Most said that they learned something new and they would share the infographics with friends and family. We could have done better uh, because the, uh, with the amount of information and the, and the length, those were both rated as a little bit more, somewhat more than desired. Uh, but you know, we felt that there was, it was important information to convey. So we erred on the side of a little too much. By the summer of 2023, when the survey was conducted, at that point, baseline knowledge about COVID-19, as you can imagine, was quite high. So it was not surprising that we saw essentially no change in knowledge scores before and after viewing the infographics. For both infographics, the large majority of respondents said that what they had seen would help them make decisions about COVID-19 testing and vaccination. So we felt that that was, we're making a kind of a valuable contribution in that respect. So aim three is focused on the development of the TaylorVis toolbox. So far, we have specified our required features and we're building out the toolbox and doing alpha testing. Uh, we'll soon move on to heuristic evaluation with 10 experts and then usability testing with 20 end users from community-based organizations. <clears throat> so we required that TaylorVis toolbox be a web-based system allowing for authentication of users with different levels of privileges. So you could have, for instance, the head of a CBO and then individual workers, uh, high level super admin, that kind of thing. It should have a ca catalog for browsing the tailorable infographic assets available in multiple languages. And we are using the term editing to refer to the CBO level tailoring and branding. Uh, so here you can see in pink outlines and highlights, you can see some of the selected areas of the testing infographic that are available for editing. So here we can swap out the image that we're using to show how a sample, a test sample is collected. You can uh, adjust how long it takes to get the results back based on what's true in your organization. And then of course here, we've used a screenshot um, from my chart, but if you have a different 
uh, EHR, you can use a different screenshot here. And of course, edit the text about uh, what to do if your test is positive or negative, um, because that guidance might change locally at any given time. So this is what the alpha version of the interface looks like. It's very, very spare, not that beautiful yet. But let's say uh, the user opts to make edits to the text in section three here. So they can just click on this box here and they can make those edits in this dialog box. So that also specifies the maximum amount of available content, which in this case is two lines of text. So for the current project, the individual level tailoring is minimal. That is, it's just whether or not you're adding those optional modules, appending them to the inf vaccination infographic. However, there are many other types of individual tailoring that will be possible. We're gonna take our entire back catalog, everything that I've shown you already and more, and load it up into the Taylor Viz toolbox. Once editing and tailoring are complete, the user can then download a PDF that's shareable via means such as print, website, and SMS. <clears throat> The infographic designs accommodate tailoring through the use of page width content blocks. So each of which can have internal columns and multiple text and image objects. So here are some notes about the technical implementation. This was provided directly by our developer. I am not a technical person. So if you have questions about this, you'll have to put them in an email to me and I'll forward them to my technical staff because I can't really tell you that much more about them. But for those of you who are more technically minded, perhaps this is meaningful to you. So just to close up with a discussion, a key limitation is that the infographics have to be individually programmed into the TaylorViz toolbox. We have a sort of a semi-automated process to it, but it is work intensive. You have to get the developer's time to make the uh, infographic work within the toolbox. Um, so further automation of that process is an area for future work. Uh, not quite sure how we'll do it, but uh, we can work on it. And two key limitations of our study were that by the time we worked with participants, they had already gained a lot of baseline knowledge about COVID-19. And also the needs of our community and CBO end users may not be the same as those in other areas. However, we do believe that our template-based approach is highly responsive to specific local needs and accommodates how the needs of CBOs might change over time. Furthermore, our approach uh, is content agnostic. So as a reminder, although we explored a use case about COVID-19, we will be adding numerous other health topics in the future. So TaylorViz Toolbox gives CBOs this technical infrastructure that they may not have the resources to develop on their own. And thus it's democratizing access to high quality health information, which is our high level goal. I've shown you that in we prioritized the CBO use case because we were working with the COVID-19 use case, but ultimately we want TaylorViz Toolbox to be available so that you could hook it onto your EHR, for instance, you could have a solo practitioner or a small group practice that could have access to this as well. So um, that's all gonna be built out as we move forward. So I just wanna extend my thanks to our funder, my colleagues, uh, community partners, but most especially to my co-PI, Sue Bakken, and our designer illustrator, Alexa de la Cruz. So you can follow those QR codes to read our preprint and to visit our repository to learn more about uh, this most recent project. And of course, if you just, I have a pretty unique name. So if you just go on PubMed, you can put my name and you can see uh, prior publications for all of the other uh, studies that we've done. We want to thank you for spending this time and, and share your expertise with us. I think you have given a tremendous amount of food for thought. What is the best way that we can communicate those health information needs that the patients have? And if ultimately what we're looking at, it is improving patient care uh, through using infographic, using visualization. So at this time, on behalf of the University of North Texas, the College of Information and the Health Informatics Program, we want to thank you.